اداء من الكويت للتدخل السريع فالاتصالات مقطوعه بيننا وبين العالم كله. At 2 a.m. local time on August the 2nd, Iraqi troops crossed the border into Kuwait. And Saddam Hussein was given one last chance to withdraw unconditionally from Kuwait. Imagine yourself standing here following all these speakers, and you're a pom. <laughs> but interesting, uh, everyone's uh, talked today about how we can change the way we think, change what we do, change who we are. But what happens when change is forced upon you? And you're probably saying, you know, why me? Why is it me talking to you today? You know, because this experience was 23 years ago. And I went to war with 40 others of my friends, and they all have fantastic war stories. You know, they did 25 war missions. They got shot at by guns, by missiles. We lost one of our friends on the squadron. Yet none of them get asked to a stunning convention centre in Melbourne <laughs> to tell their stories. So why me? Well, the reason, let's face it, the reason is, is that picture. Do you remember that picture? It means you're old. <laughs> they reckon 650 million people on this planet saw that image. And, it, and it's very strange being that picture. Because yes, okay, I went to war, I went to war, I got shot down and captured. But when I returned back home, I returned home to mass media attention. I had radio, newspaper, television, everyone coming up to me and saying, oh, you're so brave, you're so brave, we saw those pictures on television. You know, I couldn't go to a pub anywhere in the UK, it could be London, Manchester, Birmingham. I walked into a pub and the pub would go dead quiet. You then get a standing ovation in a pub. And then you wouldn't have to buy a beer all night. <laughs> but same for a restaurant, no one would accept your money. And people in the streets overwhelmingly coming up to you saying, oh, you're so brave, you're so brave. We saw those pictures on television. It's very different being behind those pictures. You know, and you experience war vicariously through television. Suddenly, you're at 20,000 feet, and it is a burning blue day, and everyone can see it, all the radars can see it at 20,000 feet. We unplug from the tank, and we roll upside down, go from 20,000 feet to 10,000 feet to 5,000 feet, and you start to speak up speed from 250 knots to 300 knots. Go from 300 knots to 350 knots, you go from 5,000 down to 2,000 down to 1,000. 350 knots to 400 knots, from 1,000 down to 100 feet above the ground, squeezing the height down to about 50, 60 feet above the ground, pushing the speed up to 450 knots. That's about 800 kilometers an hour, about 30, 30 kilometers out from target, you suddenly see a big puff of black smoke on the right hand side, a big puff of black smoke on the left hand side. Now you've never been shot at before. This is the very first time. You see these anti-aircraft guns are like ribbons in the sky come towards you. You see these plumes of missiles that go up and go behind your cockpit as you're pushing on towards target. 20 seconds, 10 seconds, we go off target. We're heading out from target. We're about 50 kilometers from target, heading back doing about 500 knots. And then suddenly you get this huge kabang and the whole aircraft is sort of shunted across the desert floor. Suddenly I'm seeing sand and sky and the aircraft rotating, rotating. And I think, I can't hold it, I can't hold it. Prepare to eject, prepare to eject. And John Nichols says, don't you bloody well eject. 
OK, then on the right-hand side, anti-aircraft battery opens up. The bullets, they hit my right-hand wing. They hit my sidewinder missile. A four-metre torch of flame shoots out the front of my wing and slowly but surely starts to cut my right-hand wing off. This was just not my day. Okay. <laughs> so we grab the handles. Three, two, one. Eject, eject, eject. Suddenly you're thrown up in, into the desert. Then the next thing, you suddenly collapse on the ground. <clears throat> and there's hush. There's death. There's not a sound. We're in the ground for about two hours. Then about 25 soldiers came. Uh, for, uh, they saw us, and from about 100 meters out to about uh, 20 meters, 25 soldiers with Kalashnikov machine guns buried it as in the sand by machine gun fire. They got to us, beat us up, took us off to Baghdad. As we approached Baghdad, all the bombs were going off, the anti-aircrafts were going off, and suddenly we're in the city, everyone's screaming and shouting there. Things are getting nasty now. They're grabbing your hair, smash your face against the side of the lorry, hitting around the head with pistol butts, and then they push you into this room, out the lorry, into this room. And you go through this corridor of troops who are kicking, rifle butting and thumping you. And then suddenly you hear this, a bomb hits the room in the far corner. The whole of this ceiling comes down. The whole of these two walls get blown up. We get picked up two metres, get thrown four metres, and end up under a pile of desks, rubble, and chairs. They then throw me into a black room, and I'm going around the room trying to find my way out, and ten guys come in. And my, my world goes black. I then found myself in a little room, got the lights on me, and you hear a voice going name, rank, number, date of birth. And they start hitting you and beating you and telling you that you have to go on television. And the last thing you're meant to do in the military is go on television. But they hit you, they beat you, they then get a gun out, they put the gun against your head, they pull the hammer back and they say, Peters, you're going on television, or you'll never see your wife and children again. So I have a very different feeling when I see those pictures. Because when I see those pictures, I remember I felt a traitor, I felt weak, and I thought that was the last time my family was going to see me alive. So why am I here? I'm a product of the media. That's why I'm here. And how do I relate this to you? I mean, I know from traveling, so few people have been in the military. Uh, you, you experience war vicariously through television. People don't go to war and not in the military. You may disagree with my job. So how do I relate this to you? Well, we all have change forced upon us. That's the nature of the world. And how do you deal with your fear and your sense of inadequacy? Because that's what I had to deal with. And I learned three things, and I hope these resonate with your lives. First, you have to accept the brutal reality. Two minutes ago as a prisoner of war is a waste of time. We all spend our lives finding a success formula and then repeating it endlessly. But what happens when the world changes? My world changed. And they, you know, don't think that this is a physical fight. This is a mental fight. And you've got people deliberately, with all the psychologists, all the experiments people have been talking about, using those to create fear and emotional fear. And basically, you have to stop that. You have to control that. Fear, false evidence appearing real. You must not let them beat, let you beat yourself. OK? And, and you have to control your emotions. How do you do that? You step away from your emotion. You start to learn. What you do is you force yourself to learn. What am I doing? How am I doing it? And my most frightening part when I thought I was going to get gang raped and afterwards, I'm shaking uncontrollably. But that was my moment when I suddenly realized, I can learn faster than you can make me fail. And I knew from that moment on, they were never going to win. Accept the brutal reality, start to learn. But please do not sit there thinking that I'm a damaged human being. Never waste the opportunity of a crisis. Do you know how much confidence this experience gives me? What's the worst you're going to do to me now after, after this? Are you going to beat me up? 
Are you going to torture me? Are you going to kill me? You know, I also found I'm not scared of death, which means I'm not scared of failure, because all it does, it means you fail, and then you learn from it, and you move on. And if you told me 23 years ago that I would be standing here talking to you today, I would have said, it's impossible. And yet here I am. So whatever impossible challenge you believe you have, accept the brutal realities. Look beyond your walls and choose your future. And I hope to God that in 23 years' time, I'm sitting where you are, listening to you tell me your story of the life you've built and the story you've built. I wish you the very best of luck. Please engage with everything here. It's stunning. And I, I thank you for the real privilege of being able to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed.